iSelect Fund is not soliciting investment or providing investment advice in any way whatsoever. This presentation is general industry research based on publicly available information. iSelect is an early stage venture capital firm in St. Louis focused on early stage companies in food, agriculture, and health. iSelect invests at the forefront of innovation, seeking emerging problems, solutions, and technologies. iSelect uses these deep dive presentations not only as a way to better engage with and understand new science and technology, but also engage with the experts and entrepreneurs who drive and change innovation in their respective fields. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to iSelect's Deep Dive series. Uh, my name is David Yoakum. Uh, you've probably heard from me before if you've been on past, um, past Deep Dives. Um, I'm a principal here. I'm on the iSelect Fund investment team, uh, and I'm excited to walk you through today's discussion. Now, one theme that we've been researching is around the future of fat. As the relationship between the food system in both environmental and human health continues to draw more and more attention from consumers, businesses, and governments, the need for better fat products in our food has become more apparent um, as an opportunity for innovation. Fats play a crucial role in the food system, delivering taste, texture, and in some cases, crucial nutritional content. However, uh, delivering fat products that deliver on function, taste, nutrition, while minimizing envir the environmental footprint of their production has been elusive to date from both animal-based and plant-based sources. In this edition of iSelect Deep Dive webinar series, uh, we explore the companies and technologies that are, are working on making the future of fat healthier, more sustainable, and delicious. Um, just to give a sense of the agenda for today, um, we're going to kick things off with some speaker intros. Then we're going to talk through the future of fat in terms of definitions and trends. Um, I'm going to provide some background context. Then I'm going to shut up. I'm going to ask some questions of our speakers, uh, who I'm really excited to have on board today. And then we're going to have some time for questions towards the end. So with that, I'd like to start off uh, with our speakers. If we could start off with Jen Yu um, from Lipid and then uh, Yu Lin from Yali Bio, that would be fantastic. Thanks, David. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Jen Yu. I'm the co-founder of Lipid, which is a fat alternative company uh, based in San Francisco. And my personal background is I'm a chemical engineer for a long time. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks, Jen Yu. And Yu Lin? Thanks, David. Hi, everyone. I'm Yulin Lu. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Yali Bio. Uh, Yali Bio is a company using precision fermentation and synthetic biology to make uh, tailored fats. Um, and my background uh, is that I, uh, I'm a bioengineer by training, and I've been in the space of thin bio and food tech uh, over the last decade, uh, a number of different companies uh, in the space. So. Um, yeah, that's that's my background. Wonderful. Well, uh, Jen, you, you, Lynn, we're really excited to have you on board today. And um, I'll try and speed through this first part so we can spend as much time with you guys as possible and learn more about your companies, technologies you're building, um, the impact they can have on the future of fat. Um, but I do want to provide some context um, in terms of background. And what I want to start off with is sort of what fats are. And I realize there's a lot of detail here. So I'd sort of encourage you just to look at mostly the images. And I'm going to talk through a lot of sort of what some of these basic components are. Um, so before we talk about the future of fat, I want to bring some understanding to what fat is, where it comes from. Um, and at the most basic level, fats are primarily made up of triglycerides, which are formed by the combination of glycerol and three fatty acid molecules, which are formed by carbon and hydrogen bonds. Now, for all intents and purposes, there are two main types of fats you're going to find commonly in foods, saturated and unsaturated fats. We can talk about trans fats, though their, their prevalence in food has decreased significantly um, particularly in the last in the last two decades um, due to health issues associated with trans fats. Um, and so for all intents and purposes, the main difference you'll find commonly is that saturated fats, which are those commonly found in animal products, are solid at room temperature. This is due to their structure, which contains no carbon-carbon double bonds, versus unsaturated fats, which on the other hand, in their natural state, have one or more carbon-carbon double bonds, which makes them liquid at room temperature. Now, a couple of important nuances within unsaturated fats, there are two core groups. There are monounsaturated fats, which are commonly found in seeds, olive oils, nuts, avocados, and polyunsaturated fats, which are highly prevalent in sunflower, corn, soybean, and fish. Um, now, some of these foods that I mentioned will have both of these, but in varying ratios. And so some of these foods um, contain both of these. Um, a common uh, polyunsaturated fat that you're likely gonna have heard of in the universe of supplements, uh, in nutrition are going to be omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, 
which are basically named for where the, the double bond occurs in the fatty acid chain. So on the third carbon or the sixth carbon. Um, these happen to be the fatty acids that the human body cannot produce internally and must be consumed exogenously. Um, so through food and nutrition. Um, both these are important for growth and repair in the body and have been implicated in preventing heart, preventing heart disease, diabetes, and certain cancers. Um, so just take a step, to just take a step back, uh, fats are carbon energy rich structures found in animal products and plants that exist primarily in saturated and unsaturated structures. So now we have some context for what fat is and where it comes from. There are some, there's three key areas that I want to discuss before we move on to our speakers. The first is going to be addressing some of the nutritional confusion around the role of fat in our health. The second is going to be the environmental footprint for both plant and animal fats. And the third is a rising need for fats that will perform well in food without compromising on the aforementioned nutrition, taste, and sustainability. So let's start a little bit with the controversial history of fat in food and its relationship to our health. So humans have been consuming animal fats for thousands of years, principally via the isolation of, um, of animal fats. Historically, fat has been derived from tallow, which is rendered beef fat, suet, which is fat from the loins or kidneys of, of, um, of beef principally, um, lard, which uh, is pork, typically pork fat, and butter, um, which are fat and protein isolates from churned cream or milk. Now, vegetable oils, which were originally used for industrial purposes, lighting, uh, but not necessarily so much human consumption, changed when Procter & Gamble was able to produce Crisco, um, a hydrogenated form of vegetable oil, and then later, the production and marketing of margarine. Now, these vegetable oil-based shorteners were advertised as easier to digest, healthier, and cheaper than traditional animal fats. Now, following the invention of hydrogenation to create products like Crisco from vegetable oils, which allow unsaturated fats to be solid at room temperature, followed the introduction of vegetable cooking oils into the American household. Cooking oils, lightly hydrogenated in order to prevent rancidity, uh, were introduced shortly after. Uh, and for some, uh, for some time, both animal fats and vegetable oil products were consumed in equal parts by Americans. But the big game changer, as you can see here on the right with this Time Magazine cover, was when the American Heart Association stated that consumers should replace saturated fats with polyunsaturated fats found abundantly in vegetable oils in order to prevent and fight heart disease. And Ansel Keys, a researcher at the University of Minnesota and featured here on the cover of Time Magazine in 1961, drove a lot of the thinking around the hypothesis that eating saturated fats increase, increases cholesterol in the blood, leading to increased risk of heart attack. This simplified view became per pervasive in the universe of nutrition and led to the demonization of animal fats from nutritional context, leading to an immense increase in the consumption of vegetable oils, which persists today. Um, and, and I show that in some data here um, on this next slide. Um, and you can see these chart on the left showing the trend in daily calories from major food groups, where you can see substantial growth in vegetable oils um, over the last 50 to 60 years um, as sort of the, the fastest growing category um, uh, in terms of average daily calories from food. Um, and on the right side, you can see it in terms of actual uh, total American consumption um, in metric tons. Um, and so in correspondence with the substantial increase in vegetable oils, um, the, the rate of, of basically you know, diet related disease cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, has also continued to climb in the US. And there's a growing body of evidence to support the presence of these processed vegetable oils in our, in our food plays an important role um, in, in largely contradicts a lot of what was claimed by the American Heart Association in 1961. Um, you know, in doing this research for this presentation, I found a lot of conflicting information about what people should and shouldn't be eating in terms of types of fats. And what I generally found and where I think most of the thinking has evolved, though there's a lot of opinions on either side of the issue, is that most nutrition experts recommend consuming mono and polyunsaturated fats, limiting saturated fats, and eliminating trans fats. However, the story does seem to change when we're dealing with processed unsaturated fats that show up in our foods and vegetable oils, particularly when they are heated during the processing stage. So here's what I will say, and it reminds me of when we dove into sugar and the consumption of refined sugars. When we process foods, we basically take them out of their original context. When we eat whole foods, we put them back into their context and significantly reduce the risk of disease. But all in all, both saturated and unsaturated fats in whole food form do play an important role in regulating cardiovascular, metabolic, and neurological health in positive ways. Um, so now we have a little bit of context around sort of the role that fats play in nutrition, some of the confusion that has occurred over the years. And I think some of the 
think we'll have some insights from, from Yulin and Gen Yu in terms of the work that they're doing in these categories. I wanna speak a little bit to some of the environmental um, challenges um, in the space. Um, so it, fats on average, you know, from both plant-based and animal derived sources account for approximately seven to eight, 700 to 800 calories out of a 2000 calorie per day diet. Um, and so just under half of, of our calories come from these sources. And so with that, the production um, of, of fats, both, both uh, oil crops and animal fat, um, takes up a significant amount of resources, principally land and water. But first, I want to take a look at vegetable oils, which is what this first, um, this first uh, slide is focused on. So you know, globally, vegetable oil crops take up over 300 million hectares or approximately 750 million acres. The majority of that production from a land perspective coming from, from soybeans, but mixed across a wide variety of, of crop types. Now, one thing that you'll notice, um, especially if you follow anything in the, um, well, I guess one thing you'll notice here from this data is that one crop dominates in terms of total volume and efficiency, and that crop is palm oil, um, grown principally in Indonesia and Malaysia. Now, palm oil is an extremely high yield oil crop. Uh, and looking through some of this data, I was—I don't think I was quite as aware of how high yielding of a crop it really is. Um, and it's and it's it's used in a wide variety of consumer applications, from foods to cosmetics and industrials. Um, it's highly versatile and low cost to produce um, from an agronomic perspective. However, palm oils have come under significant criticism, particularly in the last five to seven years for the role that it plays in deforestation, particularly in forested regions um, with extremely high biodiversity. And consumer awareness of the impact of palm oil is extremely high and has led to pushes by product companies to remove palm oil from their products. And though habitat loss uh, for highly endangered species such as the orangutan and the Sumatran rhino is cause enough to abandon and reduce our consumption of palm oils, the paradox here, and I hope you, I hope you can appreciate it from this chart, is that, um, is that the alternatives are not so good in comparison. Because the alternatives are wildly inefficient from a production standpoint, the amount of land needed to produce our current, and not to mention future demands for plant oils across food, uh, cosmetics, et cetera, um, is also unsustainable. So you know, my takeaway from, from consuming some of this data around oil, oil seed production was really either demand needs to come down in some way, or we need to find better ways to make vegetable oils and fats that perform in the way that we expect them to, um, which again alludes to some of the exciting work that, that Yulin and, and Jen Yu are working on. The last area I want to talk about on the environmental side is that while vegetable oils do get a lot of flack for their environmental footprint, particularly from a land use and from a water use perspective, it's really important to note that animal agriculture still remains a much more challenging environmental problem by comparison. And as we can see by this study here published by The Lancet, um, the fat footprint of oil crops pales in comparison um, uh, to that by animal fats in almost every category, carbon footprint, biodiversity footprint, land footprint, and water footprint. And this really speaks to some of the inefficiencies and really just in the inefficiencies of growing livestock. Since there's, you get the double whammy of land and resources used to both produce feed, but also to produce and raise animal products. Of course, there's nuance in terms of the way different crops are grown in certain instances and the way that that beef and other, other animals are produced in certain instances. And I acknowledge those nuances, but I will say on the grand scheme of things, these two agricultural commodities have significant land use and water use um, uh, components, but the uh, animal component certainly is larger in terms of its magnitude um, uh, per kilogram of fat produced. Um, so the last area I wanna talk about uh, before we move into a little bit more discussion around technology and then into the pieces with our speakers is around plant-based meat replacements. Um, and for context, this is a picture from Lipid um, that they presented on our Agri-Food Conversations webinar um, of plant-based products formulated using their fats. And so the area I wanna to speak to here is that basically from, from 2018 to 2020, we saw this substantial increase in the level of interest and excitement around the category of plant-based meats and also just in the plant-based category as a whole. And though estimates vary, um, by 2030, the plant-based meat market is expected to reach nearly 25 billion. Um, in the last few years, we saw Beyond Meat go public, Impossible Foods increase its footprint in restaurants, and saw a slew of copycat products follow suit. Um, and feel how you might about plant-based meats, but this new generation of products definitely got closer to meat than its predecessors from a taste, cooking, and textural perspective. Many do feel, however, and I feel this way as well, that these, this is basically gen one of plant-based meats and that gen one 
leaves a lot to be desired. Um, some of that potentially being reflected in the fact that growth in plant-based meat sales between 2020 and 2021 were flat in the US. Um, and one of the issues with plant-based meats is that the fats used in their formulation, most commonly coconut oil, um, but it, sometimes palm oil and others, um, does not cook the same way as animal fats, leading to a drier, oilier pro finished product that just doesn't cook the same way that meat does. It doesn't have the same mouthfeel that we're really used to. Um, and some of that's due to different melting points and textural characteristics. Um, it, with that, you know, a lot of us feel that there's another stage that plant-based meats can go to, and that one of the missing links propelling the category forward is, um, is, uh, is, is better fats that perform um, well while meeting these nutritional and sustainability goals. Um, I've covered a lot here in terms of the sort of main problems. Um, Jen Yu uh, and uh, Yulin, uh, anything you guys want to add to anything that I've mentioned here? Uh, thanks, David. I think yeah, it's it's actually really informative. Uh, the the you know uh, the material you, you put together. I think one just to add comments here. Um, uh, one part around uh, you know you mentioned about development of of, of margarine and Crisco, uh, and and I read a little bit of history about how these uh, um, you know alternatives or replacement are developed or you know the uh, inception of this, this development, a lot of it's actually due to the lack of sufficient amount of uh, of animal fats that, uh, or, or you know, in in the case of margarine, is uh, a milk shortage that leads to the industry and chemist chemists to look for alternatives. That's how you know uh, because vegetable oil is more abundant and and cheaper, so yes. uh, they you know they look for these kind of solutions. Um, and then uh, the other element you mentioned about these uh, large um, uh, vegetable oils like palm, uh, you know, a number of other options. Yes, like palm is actually a highly, highly efficient producer, yeah. uh, you know, um, for uh, making um, very, very large volumes of, uh, of fats uh, that can be used in a lot of different places. That's why. Uh, we see it in a lot of product, and that's why also like we're, um, you know, seeing a lot of uh, environmental issues because you know they're so efficient. So there's, you know, from the uh, uh, society standpoint, we just want to produce more of it, and they end up right. using more land uh, to to produce it. So those are uh, yeah, interesting facts in terms of like how, uh, you know, we got to where we are today, and uh, yeah, uh, these different systems, yeah. Yeah, and I, I had mostly only seen palm oil be lambasted by consumers and by media for the most part. And it was interesting just to read about like, I mean, any any clear any clear cut deforestation is a terrible thing that shouldn't be allowed to happen in the name of, of agricultural expansion. But there are other cases in which there's land that already had been cleared historically where they grew palm oil on it. But yeah, from it, it is, you know, it's a it is a paradox in that you don't want to continue to expand palm oil, but in the same token, you don't have much of an option in terms of arable land to expand more soybean production or other seed oil production that's just, you know, 10 to 100x less efficient than, than palm, palm oil production. Right, right. You had, you had a good comparison there in terms of coconut oil versus palm, like in yeah. terms of, uh, you know, the, the land use and the, the, the percent uh, of uh, volumes that they, uh, Produce so so I think uh, you know and, and you mentioned like you know the plant based space is primarily using coconut oil as a solid fat um, um, you know a component in in the formulations but but if you the industry is really trying to expand to to mass and uh, and get into those volumes that uh, meat consumption or, or dairy product co consumptions are um, coconut oil isn't going to be uh, sustainably uh, per, you know per, uh, supply the, the volumes that's required right yeah not not to, even to say the the functionality issues that are associated with it right absolutely and you can you can see like palm, like palm oil is already banned not banned but not it's very hard to export it right now in, in in the past two weeks news right and i also think like in the future coconut oil will probably facing the same issues when people really start to use a lot to a larger volume yeah yeah yeah, really good point, Chen Yu. Um, 
So uh, the last piece I want to cover here before we move into um, into asking some questions of our speakers um, is really around technology that's solving for better fat. And I know there's other vectors out there, but you know we've as a as an investment team focused in the universe of food and agriculture, I've I've seen three principal strategies around doing innovation in fats. One is around processing. So can we alter structure? Can we enhance nutrition? Can we change the form so that it has a higher melting point? Can we allow it to perform better? And the reason that this type of innovation is important is because one, it can leverage existing supply chain and existing products that are in the market today. And so has access to economical production now. Um, and the second piece is that it can allow for the improvement of products that have the potential to, again, sort of chip away at the environmental footprint of animal agriculture and animal produced products. We think about, again, these plant-based meat, you know, vectors that have come into market and there, there's just a continued need for differentiation in the space. And we've already seen just a, a, just a glut of copycat products move into the market. And it's really hard for people to make determinations about which ones they should be buying. And so there's an incentive, not only for companies that are building product in the space to want to differentiate using existing supply chain, um, but consumers are also looking for it as well, because it's really hard to figure out what the best you know, products are um, in the market. Um, this, I, I'd say from an advantage and disadvantage standpoint, you know, I'd say, again, it's accessing existing supply chain. In some ways, it's not necessarily fixing environmental issues associated with vegetable oils, though I will say one caveat of that is you could potentially make the delivery of fats more efficient. So the per unit amount you could make more efficient. Um, and from a nutritional standpoint, there can be a nutritional focus, but it's not necessarily inherent to the product. So, and Jen Yu is going to speak to some of this, but there's, you know, an opportunity to reduce saturated fats and introduce better other types of fats that are seen as healthier. Um, the second piece I'll cover is, is fermentation. And, and obviously, um, Yulin is going to cover this with um, his work at Yali. Um, but, you know, using technologies and organisms that we've leveraged over thousands of years, and particularly in the last you know, 50 years from a synthetic, synthetic biology perspective to produce triglyceride structures in bioreactors that have characteristics that we're looking for. And as genetic engineering tools become more and more precise, gives us more and more levers to be able to um, make fat structures that, that are exciting um, and interesting. Um, and I'd say from a biotech perspective, there's lots of existing infrastructure and know-how. Um, however, you know, cost when it comes to engineering organisms it's always, a, it's sometimes it's not necessarily about a, uh, an if, but a when, and it can take a long time to get to, um, to get to a, to a profitable production level, especially when you're competing against vegetable oils, which are extremely cheap. Um, and then finally, on the cell-based side, um, you know, we've seen some really exciting companies like Mission Barnes and others that are cultivating animal fat cells to produce fat products um, that are identical um, uh, or uh, identical or superior in performance and taste to animal fat. So instead of saying, let's make fat molecules, um, they're saying, let's make cellular fat structures that are very much the same as you would, you would hope to see from like a lard product um, that performs super well in a, um, in a food science context and in a culinary context. And what I would say about those is that there's an optimal performance um, without the environmental footprint. Um, however, cost, um, lack of know-how and lack of consumer awareness is a challenge to those industries, as opposed to fermentation, where we already get a number of foods produced via fermentation. And on the food processing side, consumers are very aware of vegetable oils. Whether or not you see vegetable oils as good, consumers are comfortable with vegetable oils and cell-based meat and cell-based uh, fat products still have a long ways to go from um, a, uh, a consumer awareness perspective. So um, what I'd like to go from here is I'd like to start off with some uh, questions for, um, for Gen Yu, and um, we're going to talk a little about some of the work that they are pursuing um, at Lipid. So um, just a brief description, um, Lipid is a deep tech startup shaping the future of food. Its phytofat um, product accurately mimics the texture and mouthfeel transfer of flavor and cooking behavior of animal fats using the company's novel formulation and microencapsulation method. Uh, but Jen Yu, can you just tell us a little bit about a little about you, the, the company, the technology, and sort of the impetus for, for building what you're building at Lipid? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, David, uh, for the quick introduction. Uh, I think we have the idea to work on this back in 
2019, the end of 2019. And I was in Cornell doing, I uh, did my PhD over there in chemical engineering uh, and doing a lot of research on the climate related technology. And what we find out over there is at, over, at that time, people are only focusing on protein part in alternative food. But as a meat eaters, we look at the difference and we know that apparently fat is the missing part. Uh, that is not really doing well enough in the, in the food that we eat from beyond or impossible. So that's how we decided that we want to like do lipids uh, and try to provide new solution uh, onto the market and try to solve this aspect of this uh, overall industry. Yeah, and that's, that's how we started. And I will say, uh, borrowing the David's uh, flow over here, the real questions that we are addressing is, can we make a solid fat without saturated fat? That's actually the question we ask a lot of ourselves as a scientist and engineers, because we think that if it's only, if we can only make solid fat with saturated fat, then yeah, probably using other approach will be most suitable, but we do see some opportunities that we can leverage the unsaturated fat or more unsaturated fat or poly unsaturated fat, but try to change its texture by other engineering approach. So that's our idea and technology behind it. And uh, in the end, we figure out like micro encapsulation is a great way to really tune the texture and muting points and all the other functionalities above it. Yeah. Can you, can you maybe speak a little bit to sort of what the, what the problems are with the current, the current plant oil solutions and then talk a little bit about what microencapsulation does in terms of fixing some of that problem. And I guess maybe even just if you could tie in a little bit about what microencapsulation means for anybody who might be, might be new to that term. Yeah, uh, so just look at the bacon in the picture. Uh, basically no plant oils can sustain uh, cooking temperature. So all the solution right now on the market, like either coconut oils or palm oils, they will melt out uh, after you cook the product. Yeah, so that's the challenge. And that's why people couldn't make a good uh, adipose tissue product uh, or food at this point. So that's the main challenge. Uh, and our approach about microencapsulation, uh, just to qu quickly introduce it, uh, you can imagine as a drug delivery industry, people use capsules uh, to protect their active ingredients. Uh, so they can deliver uh, like drugs or probiotics uh, in certain pH condition. And over here, what we are doing is to protect oils and we will release the oils and break the capsules uh, in the scenario that we design. Like for example, in, in the bacon, this case, they will be stable under cooking temperature, like 400 Fahrenheit and the capsules will start to break out and the oil will slowly leak, uh, leak out from the capsules. Yeah, so that's, that's how we do it. Got it. And, and what do you think from a thing about microencapsulation, like what, what can be controlled in terms of fat performance that couldn't be controlled previously? So are you guys mostly focused on melting point? Do you think there's an opportunity around nutritional delivery um, in terms of flavor and mouthfeel? How do you, how do you tune for all of those, the, all of those varying components? Yeah, that's, that's actually a very good experiments that we found out that we can control several different factors. There are, there are four factors over here. The, the first one we do a lot is actually on texture. So plant oil is usually in, in liquid format and we find out by using our capsules, uh, micro encapsulations, uh, we can actually pack them in different ways so they can provide different textures, like they can be solid and in different hotness or uh, even be a bit of sponginess inside. Yeah, so that's the first aspect. And the second one is, is melting behavior. We want to, uh, it really depends on the applications. Uh, like for example, in bacon, you don't want the tissue to melt out. But in burger patties, you want it to start melting when you cook the product. So you have to tune the melting behavior to really make the products uh, delicious, right? Yeah. And the third, yeah, and the third one is actually in flavors. So uh, we find out that, uh, it's not we found out, but oil is actually the most, is a very important carrier for those flavors, right? And what we were doing is uh, when we encapsulate the oils, we were also encapsulating the flavors. 
so we can we find out that we can actually deliver flavor pretty well uh, by our system yeah and the last one is surprisingly nutritional profile <laughs> actually we focus a lot on nutritional profile um, um, if you look at the impossible or beyond or the trend right now people are trying to reduce uh, saturated fat in their products and all of our mo most of our input is actually on saturated fat and that's actually a very good nutritional benefits over here that we can try to reduce the saturated fat at the same uh in, uh, with our product and at the same time we can start to add different more nutritional stuff into it, like high oleg acid or uh, different type of omega-3 or omega-6 uh, type of oils into it so that's pretty interesting that we found out yeah yeah I'm, I'm curious to your perspective on the nutritional side so like I have I every time I do more research on nutrition the more confused I get about like what's actually good for you and what's not actually good for you. In terms of like customers that you're talking to, what, are, what do they seem to be the most interested in from a nutritional perspective? Are they still focused mostly on, on reducing saturated fat in their food products? Are they mostly interested in, in flavor performance? The reason I ask about the former is that just, you know, there's a, there's a growing number of, of people who and, you know, things like the bulletproof coffee movement, et cetera, in terms of incorporating like saturated fats back into your diet and people, people going on, you know, mostly meat diets and having a great experience. And so I guess there's enough like noise out there that, um, I, I, I guess, what, what are you mostly hearing from your customers in terms of what they want to see? Um, I will say it's actually not noise. It's actually fat. Is that it actually present how fat is so critical that it can be important in different ways, right? right? So what we hear, yeah, what we hear from our partners is that everyone is looking for different functionalities from fat. So some is really focusing on nutritional profile to try to produce a product with better nutritional profile. And some of the others actually don't care that much of nutritional profile, but care more about uh, mouthfeel. Uh, like the melting point and mouthfeel, how it behaves uh, when they cook the products. Right. And the, yeah, and we also hear a lot, it's just mainly focused on flavor. They don't want to look, they don't want to see any fat in their products, but they want to taste, they, they want to feel it and taste it when people eat the product. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a bit of combination. And I think that's one of the very exciting part of this field that is in this early stage, that everyone is looking for different functionalities. And so there are a lot of different opportunities in the field. And, and you, and, and Lipid is partnering with a, with a, re, with a, um, a food service business, correct? In terms of you guys are, you, you people can go get your product right now. Uh, yeah, uh, certainly in Taiwan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> in Asia. Yeah. Can you, can you speak to what, what, what the product is, what the company is that you're working with and just what that, what what the what the food product is that you're serving? Uh, yeah, so uh, this is actually a, a market trials that we do together. Uh, actually, just launched it uh, last month. Uh, we were trying uh, burger patties uh, with our fat in it, uh, with better nutritional profile and less saturated fat in it to test the co uh, consumers' feedback over there. Yeah, so that's that's what we are working on. And I will say, uh, in the long run. What we are really doing is not just on burger patties, but we are focusing on like some high fat food products that we can really enable by those stable fat that be under cooking temperature. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, one thing I think a lot of people will be interested to know about is one, how micro encapsulation gets labeled on a product in terms of, you know, an ingredient, especially as, as plant-based meats come under some criticism for the number of ingredients they have um, and the, uh, the amount of processing that goes into those products. Um, and then the second, like nutritionally, how the human body processes um, encapsulated fat products and whether there's anything unique about that. Um, can you speak to either of those two, those two things that yeah. consumers will be interested in? Uh I think the first point is actually, I believe all the food is processed. <laughs> so it's not just plant-based food. Actually, if you think about it, every food product is actually in certain way it, it was processed, right? <laughs> like if you look at the meal powders, if you look at uh, infant uh, formulas, yeah, all, all processed food, right? So that's actually uh, my first uh, thought over here is that people, it's, 
it's like a uh, plan based tool just started and it's so many science and engineering over here but over the long run when people get used to it i, I think it was it will not be a problem uh in in the long term yeah and on the second part if it's just focusing on our own fat uh i will say we are using old food ingredients that was generally used already in the food and just imagine when you eat the drugs or eating probiotics micro encapsulated probiotics it will like automatically uh, disappear after you consume it, right? So I would say it's really not a problem uh, for encapsulation over here. Yeah, yeah. It, but it's more about how you brand or how you describe uh, how you make the products. Yeah. yeah. Well, last thing I want to ask you about, um, Jingyu, is, is just thinking through consumers want better plant-based meat products, right? And, and in the same token, the plant-based meat companies want to have some sort of competitive edge in what they're in what they're producing. Um, how do, so? I mean, you guys are principally taking a B two B route, so you're you're presumably solving challenges for your customers from a B two B perspective. But do you have any sense of how they're going to communicate the differentiation enabled by lipid in their products? Is it just going to be something like creamier mouthfeel or more meat like cooking experience? <laughs> Or are they not going to talk about it at all and just let the product speak for itself? Do you have any, do you have any thoughts on how that's going to be communicated? Uh, that's a good question that we are actually trying to figuring out. So uh, definitely for us, we, we love to see that we, we got branded into the others, other people's products because they do use our fat to try to pr uh, improve their own mouthfeel or taste, right? Uh, but in... Based on our experience, uh, that's one thing that we have to talk through because that really depends on every different partner's strategy in the market. Yeah, and some even ask for ex exclusivity uh, for this specific type of products. But I think that's also a, an interesting part of uh, a startup is that we have to explore different business models and ways to work with different partners. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know I said that was my last question, but I had one more pop up <laughs> that I that I want to ask yeah. you. Um, so we talked a little bit about sort of shifting perspectives in terms of vegetable oils and other plant, just seed oils in terms of how they're viewed um, from an environmental perspective. Like consumers are targeting certain types of, and you alluded to sort of maybe criticisms of coconut oil and the coming in the future. Um, so in terms of your process, is that is it going to be something where you have to tune it to? The, spe the specs of your microencapsulation formula to different fat types, or will that be a drop-in replacement no matter what type of oil you're working with? Uh, yeah, we have to tune it for different applications yeah. because fat actually perform very differently in, in different products. Even, even in just a burger patties, in, with a, a burger patties with soy protein and pea protein, that's already a big difference of fat that we need to mitigate their old flavors or mitigate their texture. So that's, we are doing a lot of customization for different parts, yeah. Gotcha, okay. Well, um, if you have questions for Gen Yu, um, please feel free to type them in the Q&A box. I can ask them at the end of the presentation. Um, and Gen Yu will also ask you for um, ways in which the audience can get in touch with you at the end of the end of the call today. But thank you so much uh, for uh, humoring my questions. I'm really excited <laughs> about the work you guys are building at Lipid. Um, Thanks, David. Uh, next, I'd like to talk to uh, Yulin uh, a little bit about some of their work that uh, he and his team are building at Yali Bio. As we alluded to a bit um, previously here, um, Yali is a precision fermentation startup. They engineer microorganisms to produce fats with both optimal performance and minimized environmental impact. Yali is building a designer fat engine in order to produce fats that win on taste, performance, and sustainability. Uh, Yulin, we'd love to hear a little bit more about you, your story. You've obviously been working in the universe of, of food technology for a long time, and you've made organisms produce all kinds of things um, in your career. So want to get a sense of sort of your impetus for starting this company, where you saw a gap in the market where fermentation might be a possible solution. Right. Thanks, David. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I spent quite a bit of time in the food tech space uh, with uh, a number of uh, the leading flagship uh, food tech companies and uh, um, seeing clear pain point for the space uh, in terms of 
Um, you know, the first generation products, uh, as, as we see a lot of the ground meat product on the market um, and, uh, you know, carving out a market, um, but, but it's hard to expand beyond the, the current consumer base um, because the, the gap in terms of, uh, you know, the, the consumer experience uh, versus, you know, the premium uh, or, or meat or dairy products that, uh, you know, the bulk of the consumers have. And uh, the key issue for the plant-based space primarily is from the lack of novel ingredients in general. Uh, you know, so there's limited amount of proteins that you can work with. There's, uh, again, very limited amount of uh, fats and, and oils that you can use to, uh, to formulate. Um, so the problem with the fats problem stand out because the industry almost exclusively using coconut oil as the, you know, the white uh, solid fat uh, in formulations. Um, and uh, you know it melts differently, like you mentioned, uh, David, uh, and uh, and doesn't deliver any of these flavor traits that uh, animal fats would deliver, right? So so then you have to add different types of flavor additives to emulate those uh, uh, specific target meat uh, flavors for um, for you know formulating the product. So the label is uh, you know are complex and uh, and and challenging. Um, so I have uh, quite some experience prior to entering the food tech space uh, in terms of actually using microbial fermentation to make uh, large volume uh, fermentation products. And, uh, and I see that microbial fermentation can actually be uh, used um, as an uh, efficient means uh, from carbon conversion standpoint to make tailored fats uh, products that can uh, emulate those uh, animal fat product, and that's that's the the main reason uh, for you know uh, starting the company and 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 uh, inception of of the company. Um, yeah, like like you mentioned, uh, David, fats are triglycerides. Um, it's it's a non-obvious key ingredient that uh, actually has very complex uh, chemistry. You know, in in the U.S., there's this uh, uh, professional society called American Oil Chemist Society (AOCS) actually are completely dedicated to fats and lipids, right? So there's significant amount of know-how in this space, but it's non-obvious to consumers or to um, you know the first wave of uh, plant yeah. companies that uh, you know it's it's uh, you know a critical factor and ingredient uh, to make a high quality product. So that's yeah, yeah. Can you can you say more about what it means to build a tailored fat engine? What could you tailor, and what would that mean in terms of maybe some of the themes that we talked about today? Anywhere from like nutritional performance to uh, to flavor, texture, sustainability. Um, and I, I, I put the picture of the St. Clair's butter from, uh, from your deck there because that was the first time I'd ever seen that product, but it looks like such a unique product to me that it creates this sense of like, there are, there are unique products that can be made if you could tailor the, you know, the triglyceride structure in a unique way. Right, right. Yeah. Um, one reason for um, the ability of using microbial systems to tailor fat compositions is because um, actually fatty acid biosynthesis pathway is a highly conserved pathway across uh, plants, um, animals, and the microbial systems. Uh, it's, it's actually a really elegant pathway, uh, you know, starting from um, two carbons to build up every two carbon to, um, you know, C 16 uh, carbons to 18 carbons are the, you know, palmitic acid and uh, oleic acid that we're familiar with. Um, so that's why, per, you know, the, the highly conserved uh, fatty acid biosynthesis pathway provided the technical foundation and feasibility of engineer these pathways 
uh, and and learn from you know how it's made in animal systems and uh, and plant systems to build it in the microbial system. Uh, so so that's uh, the technical foundation of making these uh, um, tailored compositions. Yeah. So when, when we talk about tailoring of composition, there are you know chain length, right? The the saturation and unsaturation, um, and you know. Uh, like you mentioned, uh, fats are triglycerides. Triglycerides meaning three fatty acids built on the glycerol backbone, right? So the positioning of how these uh, uh, fatty acids get built into these glycerol backbones also will dictate the functionality and uh, physical chemical properties of these uh, materials, right? So that's what I mean by uh, tailored composition, tailored fats. And and do you do you envision with that ability to tailor organisms to make fat structures to your to your uh, specs? Do you see that as most likely being we want to we want to build an identical compound to something we've seen before that's a very desirable compound, or do you see that as are there are there new types of structures you could make experimentally that might do something different or interesting that we haven't seen before? Right, right. The, the compositions, the diverse compositions and unique compositions that's present uh, that you can um, use as target in the, you know, from the animal fat side uh, gives a, a strong like initial targets for uh, identify those target compositions and, and build these strands to make uh, these compositions in, in microbial host. Um, but then the beauty of like the speed of thin bio and how fast we can we can build strains and uh, and testing out strains you know in this day and age of synthetic biology is that you can actually try to test out different types of strain builds and uh, and making compositions that uh, you know may have difference or you know some distance from the targets that you're trying to make and testing out to see how they uh, would perform both from um, you know, the physical property standpoint and, and then uh, understand the nutritional aspect and, the, and the, you know, digestion aspect of these uh, compositions, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, one thing I asked Jen Yu that I'm curious to get your perspective on too. So, you know, there's this, there's these views around unsaturated versus saturated fats. There's a lot of different opinions out there about what's good for you and what amounts and like, what are good products, et cetera. And so we look at the St. Clair's butter as an example, right? Clearly a saturated fat product, looks like an amazing product, um, really interesting like culinary applications. How do, you, how do you think about like balancing out, like focusing on unsaturated fats versus focusing on, focusing on saturated fats and also dealing with some of the, the confusion that I think people have around like what's good for them and what, and what quantities. How do you guys take that into account? Right, right. I, I think, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, one, like there's always different opinions on the nutrition side. Like it's, you know, uh, there's one school would say, you know, um, coconut oil is so bad for you. And then there's another school would say like, you know, it's, uh, it's actually a healthy or uh, fat. Uh, so it, it's hard to determine. Like from, from my perspective, um, um, what the consumer wants now are, and, and what's going to win the consumers are, uh, you know, the taste and uh, sensory experience, right? Like that, what you were saying, like with the St. Clair's butter, right? Like when you have that uh, visual and, and then the taste uh, um, experience, that's what's going to, you know, how it's going to win consumers. Um, and, uh, and I think evolutionary, I, actually, we've developed taste, but that, uh, help us to to kind of determine like what's uh uh what's good and what's not good for us so that's why like when we when we have in some of the products on the market right now we can clearly taste like you know if they're using like a low quality flavor additive like uh you know we we, we can pick it up right away right so um so that's why i think it's another part around uh um you know, the, I think the flavor and 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 uh, the consumer taste uh, experience uh, uh, will be the the key differentiating factor for uh, you know for any product to be to be successful and to to validate long term 
uh, nutrition and health benefits, um, you know, in, in the space. Yeah. 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 That's a really good point. Um, what, you know, one thing that I, I called out a little bit earlier on the technology slide and that maybe is a it contrasts from what you're working on versus what Gen U is working on. And then what some of the cell-based meat companies are working on is thinking and it, that was elucidated to me through seeing some of the data on like the land use that's required for like uh, for seed oil production is really just how much immense volume of seed oils and animal fat products are produced globally. I mean, it's just enormous. When, anytime you look at food system scale, it's always like, wow, like I can't believe that they make that much of this stuff um, every year. And so thinking about your guys' pathway, fermentation obviously understood from a scale perspective a lot better than what we have on the cell-based meat side, but definitely still more limited than what we have on the plant-based side. How do you how do you think about the ability to scale um, fermentation based fats in terms of what what the what markets you can reasonably go after and maybe what some of like the moonshot opportunities are where if there was increased capacity you could eventually compete with some of these other um, commodity oils. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's another good question. Uh, we uh, fermentation large scale fermentation. Um, from my prior experience, I think what's been demonstrated is that you can scale it to uh, several hundred cubic meter uh, bioreactors. Uh, so, you know, uh, from 100 to 500 cubic meter bioreactors as a process. So that's uh, a point of reference in terms of scalability of, you know, these kind of fermentation process and how you can uh, take it from, you know, early stage uh, lab concept to um, or lab demonstration to to large scale um, but any of like building of these capital assets and uh, and uh, you know scale up takes uh, takes a time horizon right so, yeah. so I think uh, as an industry and and as a company um, you know be real about what it takes uh, what are the capital resources and and uh, it will take to scale it uh, I think that's important to have um, because if if we uh, as an industry to overpromise and say like we will be competing with palm or uh, you know or even coconut uh, production uh, you know in in five ten years I think it's unrealistic it's, right. it's again you are you are ignoring the fact of these highly efficient producers like you know in in palm and and and, and these systems um, and then trying to replace it with something in more of uh, uh, infancy phase, right? Like uh, you have the technology de development and then getting it to to larger scale. Um, so, so I think those are factors to to consider for for the industry, and of course, it's critical for the company, right? Like as we demonstrate technology differentiation and and uh, how it compares with the plant based uh, vegetable oils. And, and thinking about, okay, what are the commercial pathway and, and timeline to, to scale those? And uh, who are the partners to have to, to take it to those larger scales? I think those are important factors to consider. Um, that's a really good point, Yulin. I guess, I guess with that in mind, what, what for the audience, for people in the audience who might be curious, what do you, what do you think is gonna be your first product in market and how is it going to reach consumers? Do you think it's going to be a, a, a consumer product? Do you think it's going to be an ingredient somewhere else? Um, so, I mean, obviously still figuring some of those components out, but if you had to make a best guess for people who might be curious to try Yali's products in the future, what do you think is going to end up? Yeah, so so we're highly interested in the applications in, uh, in dairy application. Um, we see uh, um, strong demand in that space and uh, and uh, great uh, price elasticity uh, depends on the quality of product right. you can make. Uh, so those are areas we're you know, um, uh, highly uh, interested of and uh, prioritizing with, yeah. Got it, awesome. Yeah. Well, Yulin, thank you so much for, uh, for taking my questions here. Um, really, really exciting work uh, and really appreciate the expertise and experience that you're bringing to what's a really important problem. Um, we've got some time here for questions uh, from the audience. And I do note that we have at least one here 
um, so far. And if you have questions, again, the best way to ask questions of Jen Yu and Yu Lin is to type your question in the Q&A box and I will answer them in the order that they're received. I believe this first one um, is for you, Yu Lin. Um, the question is, I'm curious as to how many agricultural acres a, say for example, 500,000 liter fermenter might replace. Do you have any sense of that? Uh, I don't. It's a good question. I can um, refer to some publications that we we see in the um, you know academic side in terms of uh, uh, when they're looking at uh, using microbial fermentation uh, to make um, uh, oil or fats product uh, versus uh, um, the land based approach. So yeah. so there are some references tables comparing to you know for example soybean or palm. Um, um, kind of acres, so I can I can uh, look it up and uh, and send it over to uh, um, to the audience, like if if they're interested. Uh, of, uh, yeah, but it, it's it's a good question. It's a fair question as well. It's uh, um, you know you you have to build these capital assets. You have to access to to these uh, capital assets that uh, you know are are can be expensive. Um, right, compared to conventional agriculture, right? The reason we're doing conventional agriculture in countries like Indonesia or West Africa is because it's cheap, it's low cost from a uh, cost of production standpoint. Yeah. But, but the added cost around uh, environmental damage uh, around, uh, you know, uh, and it's, it's a large scale uh, environmental da damage that we're doing, like how does that, you know, what is the cost there, right? And yeah. how are we gonna be, uh, yeah. Yep. Well, I'll pause here and see if there's any other questions from the audience, um, just for a moment before we uh, wrap things up here today. Well, if there are none, uh, what I'd like to ask, um, you Lin, and then Jen Yu, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you uh, if they they want to they want to catch up with you more on this topic? And um, what are what are some things that would be the most helpful to you and your company as of right now? You Lin, if you want to kick things off. Yeah, so um, yeah, my email is yulin at yalibio.com. So, you know, feel free to send me an email if you want to uh, have a follow-up discussion. Uh, or if you're interested in um, learn, learning more about uh, you know, the, the products that we're building. So, yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lin. And Jen Yu? Yeah. And my email is genu with a dash at lipid.co, C-O. Yeah, and also happy to follow up. Uh, and you can actually find me through LinkedIn. That's also a great way to connect. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Jen Yu, Yu Lin, really appreciate both your times today. Thank you for the audience, for your participation and engagement um, this morning. Um, again, I'm David Yogamo, principal here at iSelect Fund. Uh, we, we host these deep dives typically once a month, uh, sometimes once every two months, and the, and the themes usually alter from sort of food and agriculture to healthcare um, system innovation. Um, thank you again for your time today, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, thank David. you, David.